The other thing about uh, Nicolas de Ovando was he was very, very close uh, politically to Ponce's old boss, um, Pedro Nunez de Guzman. So then when Ovando arrives in the New World, Ponce's political status went straight to the top because now his, his old master's buddy is here, the governor. So he's also a military order man. Ponce is a military order man. So in 1504, the second war breaks out in Higüe, and Juan Ponce is made the commander of the troops from Santo Domingo. And this is the first time you see Ponce de Leon coming forth and being described in the chronicles, discussing the, the, the new world. Uh, all, that, all that comes before that is um, pretty much just worked out based on what was happening there. So after the province is conquered, Ponce is made the, essentially the governor of the province. He's made lieutenant of the province and he's told to establish two settlements, um, and, which he does. As I mentioned, it's not goal bearing. So they all set up ranches uh, and farms and produce cassava bread and salt pork. And Ponce himself was in the cattle ranching. Again, I think that goes back to his roots in Spain. So, this is the eastern province of Higüey, and this is the town he set, set up, Salvaleon de Higüey, which was actually on a river called the Yuma River, which comes out right here. And so there was a port there. And the mining, these, these are all like mining regions. Um, so there was a huge mining industry here, and that just sucked in all, all the bread and all the salt pork and anything that was comestible into that zone. So when you had Spanish ships that would arrive and unload their cargoes, that they needed to resupply to head back to Spain. And the prices of bread were very expensive and often they couldn't get what they needed to cross the Atlantic. So they would just come along the coast here, anchor up in Ponce's Harbor and get whatever they needed at reasonable cost. So these guys were all making good, good business on supplying the mine region and making, uh, supplying vessels going back to Spain. But there was also cross passage traffic between the Taino Indians of San Juan, Bautista, which is what we know today as Puerto Rico, and Española. And news got to Ponce that there was gold on that island. So uh, he went to Ovando and said, you know, I'd like to go across and I'd like to explore that island and, and prospect and see if we can't find some gold there and start mining. And Ovando was good with that. So in 1506, he takes three ships and he anchors off the west coast. They go ashore. They actually settle into a community here known as Mapo el Grande and in what would later become San Germán and explore the island where they find this wonderful bay here and eventually begin prospecting and mining operations here. In 1508, he, uh, he goes back to Ovando and they basically get a contract and he takes another load of people and he lands on the south coast with those guys and, and sets up some businesses here. Um, this is the, the coat of arms for the town of Salvaleon, uh, which he settled. This is part of the ennobling process. And this is, so this is the mouth of the, uh, the Yuma River. So Ponce, who had lots of experience in how not to run a colonial venture, decided that he wanted to do things differently in Puerto Rico. So what he did was he did not want to impact the, the native's food supply as much as was normal. So he imported his mining supplies from uh, his harbor here um, at Yuma and also from Mona Island so as to support his, feed his miners without having ugly things happen with the natives. And uh, this is just um, a beach that probably would have seen quite a bit of activity in those days. And this is all at Yuma. And this is where the barge traffic would have been, boats carrying <coughs> salt pork and bread to the vessels, which then would have transported it to San Juan um, or you know, gone on to transatlantic ships. So when, when Ponce settled in an area, he would build a stone house. This is his house in Salva Leon. The house would serve as essentially this, the, govern, the government center there in the province. So all the government records were kept there. The arms, the government arms were kept there, uh, and the treasury was kept there. 
And so if there was a rebellion, it would also serve as the strong house. Most other structures were wood and you know, thatch and that sort of thing. So when he went to Puerto Rico, he did the same thing. He set up a stone house in Caparra. It became a, 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 essentially a hallmark of his uh, colonial practices. So things were going really nicely in Puerto Rico. He had a good little deal going there. He brought his family over. Um, but in 1509, all that changed because um, Diego Columbus was appointed the governor of the New World at that time. And that was a political favor that King Ferdinand had to pay back to uh, a duke who had supported him when he came back to Spain after the death of Queen Isabella to keep things from blowing up. So he did not particularly like Diego Columbus. Diego Columbus had grown up in his household and he knew him all too well. And Diego Columbus was a proud, uh, well, a proud, well, I was going to say Spaniard, but he was of Genoese descent. But he was very, very jealous of his father's contract. And he held the king to the letter of that contract. What were his rights as the heir and what were the king's rights? And the king and the queen never in their wildest dreams imagined that there was this huge Americas thing on the other side of the ocean. They expected Columbus to go over and set up trading stations. And so the contract was sort of designed that way. Uh, so when Diego Columbus heard about the deal that the king had going with Ponce, he became infuriated. And even before he left Spain for the New World, he started to undo that. Um, and at the same time in 1509, the king had also granted uh, a couple of contracts for people to go and settle in Tierra Firme, in what is today Colombia and Panama. And he interfered with those operations once he got, into, got to the New World and, and in fact was responsible for quite a few Spaniards dying there because of the supply issues, because he basically embargoed the, the expeditionary's properties. So what he did in the case of Puerto Rico was he appointed some of his officials to run Puerto Rico and they went over to Puerto Rico where Ponce was happily mining away with his friends and family and 150 settlers went with them. So they landed in Puerto Rico and they established a town in San Germán on the west coast. And the first thing they do is they distribute the Indians. It was, uh, the term was called repartimiento and it's what was done on Espanol. It's like, okay, this chief and his people are gonna take care of you and serve you. And they'll do, and you'll tell them what to do and they'll do it. That's, anyway, that's the system that was set up and Ponce had not installed that system there. So when the Columbus officials imposed that system there, that caused a lot of friction and that led to a rebellion in 1511. Um, but the king did not, there were counter moves. The king appointed Ponce governor and he had the decree smuggled to his treasurer in Santo Domingo, who then put it on a vessel and had it smuggled into Puerto Rico and given to Ponce because he didn't want Diego to get any news of it. He didn't want him confiscating the paperwork for one thing. So Ponce gets this decree in uh, 1510 that he is the governor. So he, get, he gets his supporters. He says, I have an important announcement. I need you all to be present, you know, come to the plaza. And he calls the officials and they all get together there. He opens it up and says, I, the king, appoint Juan Ponce de Leon governor of Puerto Rico. And Columbus's officials said, well, that's not valid. That's not legal. He can't do that. He doesn't have that power. That's not in the contract. We are the political appointees on this island, and you are not. That's not, you're not the governor. At which point Ponce said, well, you can explain that to the king in person. You're under arrest. And he shipped them to Spain under arrest. Just made them go away. <laughs> Uh, he actually did it by embargoing a ship that was in the harbor at the time that belonged to one of those officials and persuading the captain of that vessel who worked for one of these officials to take his boss to Spain under arrest and essentially work for Ponce after that and represent Puerto Rico as a procurador or essentially their representative before in the king's court. So he did that. And that triggered a court case. The king, Diego Columbus sued the king. And the king lost. <laughs> on a number of counts. He lost on the, he did not have the rights to appoint political officials 
And that's, the court's like, there, there is black and white in the contract. You can't argue with that. But the right to appoint Indian labor was something that belonged to the king. So the, the fight, the political fight after that was over the Indian labor because the Indian labor represented the wealth. The Indians worked in the mines. The Indians took care of the cattle herds. The Indians worked in the fields. So whoever had the Indians had the wealth. Uh, so uh, while the court case is going on, the Indian rebellion breaks out in 1511. Ponce puts it down, more or less. He establishes some control over the island. But a, an alliance between the Taino Indian of San Juan and the Carib of the Windward and Leeward Islands has occurred. Um, and so now they're fighting, basically they're in big Indian wars. And for the next 20 or 25 years, the island would not be at peace. There would be raids all the time. Uh, but there was some semblance of control. And so then in 1512, um, after the case has been decided, the king sends the same officials back with instructions from him. So the king is now exerting some authority over these Columbus appointees by saying, okay, I'm appointing you. So he's like, I'm appointing you now and I'm giving you responsibilities in terms of defense and what you're gonna do. So he was exerting control in that manner. But they show up in 1512 and establish the town of San Germán. And Ponce is left without a job, so to speak. Um, but there's other things that have been going on to the north. Uh, this is an image of Ponce landing on the south coast in 1508. I probably should have had that earlier on in the, uh, in the slideshow. It's obviously a very romantic uh, depiction of what that meeting would have been like. I don't know if Ponce was a redhead or not, but he's depicted as such here. So this was the town of San Germán that was set up by the Columbus uh, faction. This is Ponce's settlement over here. The capital was called Caparra. And the king eventually referred to it as, as Puerto Rico because there was a lot of gold coming out of it. It was a rich port. And over time, the island name and the capital name changed. So now it's the island of Puerto Rico and the capital is San Juan. Um, so when, when this operation got going, a trade sprang up between these two islands. And this inter island trade uh, during the early period, when I say early, like 1512, 1513, when the Columbuses are in charge, it's all, all the inner island trade is going here. So this is the big economic hotspot where all the business is. Ponce is out here. He gets some ships trade calling from Spain, but there's not as much. I mean, the gold mining is good, but there's not as much inner island trade going on. But what this has caused, this, this race between uh, I mean, these, some of the products of the, uh, actually the inner island trade, uh, were wooden gold mining pans, like for carrying the uh, ore and for washing it in the water. They were called bateas, de lavar y de servicio. Cotton hammocks and shirts. Uh, cotton was a big a crop as well. And salt pork uh, were also, the, and these were the products of the inner island trade. They were agricultural, agricultural products because when Spaniards left the island of Española to go to another island, they were interested in gold mining. They weren't interested in planting crops. So they immediately became dependent on imported food services, as it were. So this trade sprang up. This was the disaster that almost completely went away in Tierra Firme. There was gold here, there was gold in Puerto Rico, and there was gold in Cuba. Jamaica had no gold, it was like Higüe. So they exported comestibles and cotton products. And so this, this system sprang up where you have, you know, agricultural products being exchanged for gold. And this is the earliest European sort of commerce uh, that got set up in the New World. And Ponce himself engaged in this commerce. These are the trade routes. 